Hi everybody and welcome back to our all church series quest to be the best how to make the rest of your life the best of your life and our small group study the six phases of faith we're gonna have fun today in fact we've got something special as promised we've got a small group exclusive later in our broadcast Scott Turner the nine-year NFL veteran who always brings a great word whether it's a celebration service this past Sunday he was also at City Church also at our Marines Lounge. Well, he's with us in each one of our small groups. He's going to be on with me in the next few minutes together. But before we get to that, I'm going to share with you, I hope, news you can use. But I want to take a moment again and share news we can use. And the first thing, we've got Blessed to be a Blessing. That's coming up right around the corner. And I want to thank you. You know, in October, our Blessed to be a Blessing to other people is our Feed the Children peanut butter drive. You guys are doing Fantastic, and thank you so much for going to Ralph's, Albertson, Stater Brothers, or your favorite grocery store and getting peanut butter. What a difference it's making. Remember, one jar of peanut butter serves 15 different sandwiches. And in San Diego County, one out of every five children go to bed at night not knowing where their next meal is coming from. We thought, boy, we want to do something about that. And so there are organizations that are asking not for jelly, not for bread, not for other foodstuffs, but for peanut butter. You know the nutrients and the protein that comes from it. One, if it makes 15 sandwiches, we are collecting as much peanut butter as we can. So again, if you haven't had an opportunity, maybe as an entire small group, get as much peanut butter as you can. Bring it to the church. We've got bins out in our living room. Drop it in, and at the end of this month, we're going to be able to bless a whole lot of children, hundreds and hundreds, throughout San Diego's North County. We want to encourage you to do that. Bring it with you if you can. And then also, don't forget, blessed to be a blessing in November. That is our 30th annual Thanksgiving Sunday Supper. What an incredible time that's going to be. And it's right around the corner. We're going to be feeding the homeless. Hundreds gather together. We have toys for all the kids. We've got haircuts and trims. For those who come and would like to kind of be spruced up, we're going to have games for the kids, crafts for the kids, also a clothing drive. So please begin to start thinking about what's in your closet that is very seldom worn that you can give to someone else. And be sure, we don't want it to be junk. We want it to be something that you'd be comfortable wearing. Please have it clean. Bring it to the church. We're going to collect that on that great day. We're going to be able to give warm socks and jackets and pants and shirts and clothing to the women and men who join us at Thanksgiving Sunday Supper. And then December, you know, that's our gratitude gift to God. We'll talk more about that later. But please, regarding the supper, there is a sheet which talks about how you can get involved. We're needing dozens of turkeys, turkeys that you buy, you cook, you slice, and you'll bring it. And we'll be using that on the 18th on the Sunday before Thanksgiving. It's going to be a great opportunity. Jesus said it best, didn't he? It's more blessed to give than to receive. Genesis 12, 2 says we are blessed to be a blessing. So small group, get involved. A lot of great stuff going on. What an opportunity to make a difference for Jesus Christ. And remember this, empty stomachs have no ears. If folks are hungry, it's very hard to communicate the love of God. So help us regarding feeding the children and then Thanksgiving, providing a supper and music and an experience they'll never forget. Okay, guys, with that, do me a favor, grab your workbook, quickly turn to page 20 with me. We're going to take a look at our key verse, the verse we're committing to memory this week. Our topic is delayed by God's design, and the verse goes right along with it. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us never grow tired of doing what's right. For if we do not faint, we'll reap our harvest at the right time. Oh man, what a great verse to commit to memory this week. It reminds us that our time isn't always God's time, but it always turns out to be the right time. The Bible says in Matthew 9, verse 29, According to your faith, it will be done unto you. That phrase you and I know Jesus used over and over again in his ministry. We know that he performed over 40 miracles. We know often he would say to the person in need of healing or help, according to your faith. And we understand that when you want to experience God's best with your life, it begins with faith 
in God. So we've taken the word faith, if you've been with us at our celebration services, and it's become an acronym for us, F-A-I-T-H, for all I trust Him. If you think about faith, that's where you can begin and end. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says that Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. So we've been talking about that in our Quest series. This is a faith building, life bettering series. And remember how often scripture speaks about faith in Him. Several weeks back, we talked about little faith. The Bible speaks of great faith, lack of faith, exceptional faith, damaged faith, daring faith. And scripture also speaks of growing faith. So anytime you read scripture and you hear the same thing repeated over and over again, that's cause to pause. That's to really focus on what's communicated. And Jesus would often communicate that. And that applies to us today. So what we want is great faith, exceptional faith, a growing faith, because that determines the blessings that come into my life and yours. So God develops our faith through the six phases of faith. Several weeks ago, phase one, we talked about that's the dream. God puts something in your heart. And phase two, you make a decision to go after and fulfill that dream. And then phase three is the delay phase, the waiting period. Dreams are almost never fulfilled instantly or immediately. There's a time lapse. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought, why does God wait to sometimes answer our prayers? Why does he delay? I mean, you might think, He's all powerful. He hears when I call on him immediately. Why in the world is there a delay? Maybe I should ask you like this. What's your favorite gym? For some, it's a home gym. For others, 24-hour fitness or LA fitness or crunch. Some, maybe it's planet fitness. Now, these gyms and others might be slightly different, but one thing they all have in common is that there's a weight room. There's a place to develop. And God, God also has a weight room. His is spelled W-A-I-T. You see, God allows delays in our lives. Sometimes there's seasons of waiting because he's using that to develop us spiritually in ways we can't garner any other way. Let me give you an example. Noah had a dream of building an ark. He had to wait 120 years before the flood. That's a long wait. Moses, he was also in a weight room. 40 years in the desert with the people of Israel. He had a dream of a promised land, but he went through a season, a long one of waiting. Abraham, he had the dream of being a father of a great nation. That didn't happen until he was 99 years old. Joseph eventually became prime minister of all Egypt, yet we forget it was preceded by 13 years, much of it spent in a prison, a time of waiting, a time of him developing. Paul, 14 years in preparation. He was the chief spokesperson and leader of the early church. But 14 years before he reached that place. How about Jesus? 30 years of life before he began his three years of world-changing ministry. You see, God's patient and we hate to wait. We talked a few weeks ago about being in a grocery line or a doctor's line, traffic jams, restaurants. Christmas presents, having to wait. We talked about Disneyland, and they call it Disney Line. And we thought, I can relate to that. It is no fun waiting in line. You know, I saw something the other day about a man by the name of Robert Samuel back east in New York City. He has a professional line sitting company. Watch this. My name is Robert Samuel. I own a professional line sitting company called Same Old Line Dudes here in New York City. Same Old Line Dudes started by accident when the iPhone 5S came out. I put an ad on Craigslist and offered to wait for somebody's phone. Ended up selling my spot, got a line again, sold a couple more spots and had $325. And the rest is history. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Family. And I like to think of myself as a very friendly and talkative person, so I'm not going to be bored for very long. Isn't that great? Now, if I hear about a professional line sitting company in San Diego, I'll know that somebody in a small group got the idea from what we just saw. But why do you think the people of Israel had to wait so long, 40 years, before they reached the land of promise? Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 tells us, When Pharaoh finally let people go, God did not lead them along 
the shortest route to the promised land. God said, if the people are faced with a battle, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. That's a great text. Two things we learn from it. Write this down if you would. Number one, God uses delays to prepare us for future difficulties. He develops us during those times. And number two, God uses delays to test our faith. Deuteronomy 8.2 says, The Lord led you through the wilderness for all those 40 years, testing you to find out how you would respond and whether or not you would really obey Him. Isn't that a great verse? In that verse, it explains the why of why God often puts you and I in His weight room. Now, there's two places we often don't want to be. His weight room where there are delays and also His woodshed where there's discipline. Now, He'll even use the delays to discipline us, but it won't be as painful. So it's not bad. So how do you respond when you're going through some kind of delay in your life? For many of us, it's probably applying right now. Let me give you quickly four principles. Number one, here's how you handle it. Don't fear. You see, fear keeps you in the wilderness and prolongs the delay. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. What a promise. If the first principle when you're going through a delay is don't fear because he's with you, the second one is don't fret. I'm going to give you these in F so you can't miss it. Don't fret. Write that down. Numbers 21, 4 and 5 says, On the way the people lost their patience. They spoke against God and Moses. They complained. And when you read the scriptures, they complained about everything. First, there was too much water at the Red Sea. Then there was no water when they got across. And then there was bitter water. And then there was no food. And then everything was bad. Psalm 37, 7 and 8 gives us the answer. It says, rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for Him to act. Don't fret and worry. It only leads to harm. You see, resting can be an act of faith. Resting in Him means you are waiting in Him. There's that word faith again. For all, I trust Him. And He's developing you in His weight room. Now there's a third principle. You don't fear. You don't fret. And the third one is don't faint. Get that down. Numbers 14, 2 through 4 says, All the Israelites grumbled against Moses. If only we had died in Egypt, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Oh man, what a tragic verse. They gave up on their dream for their lives, on the dream God had for them. It just got too hard in this season of waiting through the delays and they said, let's just go on back. You don't want to do that. If you find yourself in a situation now, recognize God is there. And he wants you to be persistent. He wants you to pray. In fact, there's an acronym that I use all the time in my own walk, in, my, in circumstances that I run into. The word is hope. Hope. You want to continue to hope. That stands for hold on. Hold on. And pray expectant. Hold on and pray expectant. The Israelites in that desert didn't. They gave up on it. Don't let that be you. And so that's where Galatians 6, 9, our key verse, our memory verse comes in. Let us never grow tired of doing what's right. For if we do not faint, we'll reap our harvest at the right time. That's good stuff. Look at Luke 18, 1. Always pray and never lose heart. We see it in one of the great verses in Scripture, Isaiah 40, 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and shall not faint. Ooh, doggies, is that good stuff? Absolutely. You know, you don't want to fear, you don't want to fret, you don't want to faint, and you don't want to forget. Psalm 106, verse 7 and 8 and 13 says, They forgot the many times God showed them His love, and they rebelled against the Almighty at the Red Sea. But He saved them as He promised. But they soon forgot what he had done. They had no patience for his plan. Oh man, isn't that a convicting verse? I hope it's not indicting. I hope you're not going, oh man, that's me. You don't want to be that. Lost patience with God's plan. 
Remember, you're in his divine weight room. He is developing things in you and in me. We don't get any other way. Look at this scripture. Psalm 103, verse 2. I will bless the Lord and not forget the glorious things he does for me. 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not being slow in carrying out his promises. Rather, he is being patient with you. Guys, isn't that a great verse? I mean, while we're waiting on God, God is waiting on us. He tells us he's patient with us. He's developing us in that weight room. Doesn't want us to throw in the towel. In fact, he says, don't fear, don't faint, don't fret, and don't forget. A great example of that is the friend we had at celebration service this weekend. Scott Turner, went it great? I mean, my gosh, what a lover of God. And he's talking about whether you're an athlete, He's also been a state representative, a congressman. He's also a successful businessman. Yet no matter who you are or in what station of life, we go through seasons where it's tough. Scott joined me for a short video shoot exclusively for our small groups. Let's spend our final few minutes hearing from Scott. Let's watch. Hey guys, and we've got Scott Turner in the house with us. We're so glad to have you with us, Scott. Hey, Welcome. Thank you, Pastor Sean. Thank you, sir. Oh, man. We've so appreciated him, and we're going to have an opportunity. This is a small group exclusive. This is just for our small groups. So, Scott, you know what? We so appreciate you now. We just had a teaching a few moments ago, mm -hmm. so we don't have much time. Right. But we wanted it just for the small groups. Yes, Do you sir. think they're worthy of a little bit of you? You're totally worthy. I'm glad to be with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know what? Um, our small groups are all over North County, mm -hmm. and we so appreciate them. Very blessed to have them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, would you talk to us a minute? You've been an NFL player. Uh, nine years you were in the league. Yes, sir. And what many fans don't understand is that each team, 53 players, is made up of small groups. Right. You, you know, you've got a probably about 14 different coaches per team. Right. You, everyone knows the head coach, right. but you would not have an effective team without those other coaches with tight ends, defensive backs, right. linebackers. Mm -hmm. Would you say a word about the importance of small groups on a professional football team mm -hmm. and also when it comes to our faith? Absolutely, and you're, you're right about the small groups on the team. You know, any uh, NFL team has uh, as Pastor Sean says, several different position groups, defensive back, linebackers, offensive linemen, quarterbacks, tight ends, etc. And the importance of that is when you get into your small groups or when you get into your, to your uh, position groups, that's where the, really the intimate relationships are formed. Mm -hmm. And that's where the intricacies of the game are really talked about because when you have the whole team together, it, it's kind of a, a, a mass conversation. But when you're in your small group or your position group, you're talking about defensive backs specifically, mm -hmm. or you're talking about linebackers specifically, and you build a trust, you build relationship, mm -hmm. you build intimacy uh, with guys in your position groups. And I like to relate that also to our small groups in church. It's one thing to be in the big church together and hear Pastor Sean and hear worship and hear a message, which is all awesome. But when you get into your small groups, that's where you begin to form your relationships, <laughs> man to man, woman to woman, you know, husband to wife and group to group. Mm -hmm. And also that's when, when you get into this word, you can take your time and break it down little by little. And if questions need to be asked, you know, that's the place where you can ask them. And small groups are so so important, Pastor Sean, because though the church is big, the small groups make it small and intimate. And so I'm a huge proponent and a, and a huge supporter of small groups uh, uh, in the church as well as in sport. Oh, I'm telling you what. Hey, guys, I didn't tell him to say all this, but he just absolutely <laughs> nailed it. And I sure appreciate Jesus started with a small group. There is something special mm -hmm. about that intimacy which takes place, yes, huh? Sir. And then we get together, you guys go on down the tunnel mm -hmm. and out on the field before mm -hmm. thousands and before millions on television. Right. But it starts in those small groups. Absolutely. Same thing with our faith, huh? Yes. Man. Yeah, because, you know, when you build together, just like in your small groups that you have now, you see each other differently. You know, you can see people in church, you say, hey, you know, you wave over there and you see them. But when you're in a small group together, that's where the conversation you know, one-on-one -on -one starts. Mm. That's where you can really kind of dig down and say, hey, brother, you know, tell me about how you doing. Mm. You know, and you spend that time with them. And it's the same thing. We're coming in that tunnel, you know, getting ready to go out to the game. You see the whole team 
But prior to that, Monday through Saturday, those position groups have been meeting and forging and, and, and relationship together. And so when the whole team comes, just like when the church comes together or the body of Christ come together, there's a, 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 an army, but there's many small parts to that army that make it strong. Man, bless the Lord and our head coach, Jesus Christ. Amen. He modeled that for us. <laughs> bless the Lord. Yes, sir. You know, there's so many exciting things when it comes to the things of our Lord and faith. Now, First of all, we want to thank you. We've had you on a whirlwind. You've shared with us at Cannon Road. We got you down to City Church. You're now with us in our small groups. We so appreciate it. But, you know, Scott, take a moment, would you? Because, you know, one thing we talked about was the fact that these pros, you know, they're usually in Pop Warner earlier than 10 years of age. Right. Then by about 21, mm -hmm. if you have the skill set, and God blesses to the way he does, you get an opportunity playing professional football. Right. And yet, once it's over, and it ends quick for most, three years, huh? Yes, I, I think 24 years of age mm -hmm. is the length of time for the average athlete to play in the National Football League. Yes, sir. Now, God's favor was on you. You were able to play the sport for nine years. Yes, sir. You know, when you think about the opportunities that God gave, talk to us about it with such a violent sport, mm -hmm. where God was in your heart and on some of the players on the team and what difference can God make, whether you're an athlete or no matter what you do with your life? Can you say a word about that? Yes, sir. And it's true. You know, the average career in the NFL is only three years. And some people say, well, you know, that's a short period of time. But because of the violence of the sport, because of the competitive nature of the sport, you know, there's 32 teams. Mm -hmm. There's 53 men per team on an active roster. And so you think you have a million college football players Okay, and 1% of those go to the NFL. Mm. And then less than 1% of those last that first year, and even a smaller percentage lasts longer than three years. <laughs> and so God's grace uh, on me to last nine years or to play nine years is tremendous. Mm. And you know, the thing about it is, is, is yes, I commit my life to Christ when I was in NFL, before I got to the NFL and I was a Christian in the NFL, but I had men come alongside of me to disciple me and to train me, men like Daryl Green and Aeneas Williams and Tim Johnson and Sherman Smith, men that had played the game long before me to come alongside of me and teach me, hey, this is how you um, are successful in the National Football League. And really, a lot of what they said, Pastor Sam, had nothing to do with play. Mm. It was character. Mm. It was faith. Mm -hmm. and, and to tell mm -hmm. you the truth, God's Word is what not only got me through the NFL, but helped me to thrive in the NFL and my relationship with Christ, my you know, goodness. and then, you know, God's grace, my you know, to make it. And so I say that because in life, mm. we live in a, in, a, in a sinful world, in a competitive world. Mm -hmm. You know, the enemy is, is no stranger to conflict and violence. Mm. The enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Mm. But Jesus said, I've come to give you life and that more abundantly. And so the lifespan of us as Christians, you know, we don't go on what's average. We live according to God's word and say, Lord, thank you for this day. As you said earlier, you know what? This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. And I think that type of attitude as a Christian every day, Lord, I thank you for this day. And I'm going to give you everything I have this day because you've blessed me so much. Now let me be a blessing to someone else. And to me, that's kind of my mantra in life. <laughs> and you've done that for us this weekend. I mean, teaching here at the church, preaching and right now with our small groups. In fact, guys, we can listen to this man all day, amen. And I'm going to tell you what, I miss that Southern drawl. If God would have given me that. Oh, oh, so thank you so much, Scott. Yes, Here's what we shared. We talked about today, God's called us not to fear, not to fret, not to faint, mm -hmm. and not to forget. What's that mean to you? Well, it means the world to me. Because God is telling us to do the opposite of what the enemy of the world says do. Mm -hmm. The world says, oh, you should be afraid. Mm -hmm. You should fret. It's not going your way. You don't know what the unknown is. But God says, fear not, mm -hmm. right? Perfect love casts out fear, <laughs> right? You're my, God is my great and mighty reward. You know, his word says everything opposite of what they say. We don't have to fear because we know the almighty. We don't have to fret and we don't have to be afraid of the unknown because we know who holds the future in his hand. And so what that means to me, it's a reminder to me to say, you know what? If God be for you, who could be against you? And that his word is true. His word is flawless. It's God inspired and it's for you. And his promises in him are yes 
and him, amen. And so you don't have to fear, and you don't have to fret, and you don't have to forget the power, the presence, and the promise of God for your life. Oh, man, turn me loose. That's good <laughs> stuff. Oh, man. Hey, we've only got a few more moments. But, um, you know, Scott, would you share with us, just take a final moment, and a word to the New Venture family, mm -hmm. meeting in small groups. Mm -hmm. It's not enough to enjoy them on Sunday mornings, mm -hmm. but they want more. We want to go deeper. We want to be that all that God wants us to be. Mm -hmm. Can you have a word of encouragement for us? Yes, sir. I would like to first say thank you, Pastor Sean, for your leadership. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your stewardship, you and Ms. Lori and, and Sean, and just what your family has meant to this area mm -hmm. and to San Diego as a whole. And thank you, New Venture. Uh, for always welcoming me and making me feel right at home. I love you. You know I do, and I always will. And I want to encourage you to stay involved in a small group. Jesus himself loves small groups. The early church started in, in the home. It started in small group. And today in 2018, we need to carry on not just the tradition, but the principle of meeting together, breaking bread together, fellowshipping together, praying together, warring together in small group because that's where the victory is won. And then we come to church together and we worship and we sing and we pray together. That's just icing on the cake, but the small groups is where the battle is won. God bless you, I love you. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott. Hey guys, now it's your turn. It's your turn to get together, fellowship, discuss what we've talked about, even some of the words that we've shared up here in our final few moments. I'm gonna ask Scott to close us off in prayer. So would you with me? Would everybody bow your heads in your homes, wherever you're meeting right now? Let's talk to God together. Scott, please lead us in a prayer. Yes, sir. Father, we do thank you for this opportunity to meet together as a small group of believers. Father, I'm praying for your anointing. I'm praying for your spirit. I pray for wisdom and clarity. Lord Jesus, to be in every home. Father, every place that meets as a small group. Father, be with the facilitators. Be with the teachers. And Father, be with those whose hearts are there. Father, let our ears be open, let our hearts Father God, be open to the word that you speak. And God, we thank you. We thank you for New Venture. I pray you bless the church, bless the small group, bless Pastor Sean, and all of those who make up this great church family. Father, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Scott, thank you thank so you, very Pastor much. Sean. Hey, we love you guys. Enjoy your group. God bless you.